I'm Pastor Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives here, across the street, and around the world. We're glad you're all here today. Um, I want to make sure everybody has what you need. As you came in, if you want to receive communion, did you pick up a communion kit? If not, please raise your hands, and we'll make sure you get one. Okay, um, there, it, I, I know that uh, Sandy and John will run and get some. Anybody else? I know Jean needs one. Anybody else need a communion kit? All right, very good. Everyone is welcome to receive communion. We, we practice an open table here. And also want to say hello and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you're a part of us as well. We hope wherever you are, you are safe. And uh, we want you to know you're a part of the Havity Grace United Methodist Church family as well. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. As we look forward to Christ's future coming, look back to remember Christ's first coming, and welcome Christ into our hearts in the present day. There is a clipboard coming around, an opportunity to sign up uh, for the Welcome One Shelter. Now, all the hands-on uh, duties have been covered this month, but if you want to sign up to make a financial contribution, you can do that. Uh, that's an opportunity. I do want you to know, however, that these contributions don't just go to the Welcome One Shelter. They're for hungry people wherever we find them. If it's your first time visiting with us, or if you've never gotten a letter from the church or a mug delivered to your door, uh, please fill out one of those little blue cards that's found in the pew racks and, and drop that in the offering plate. Because we want to reach out and welcome any who, who come and worship with us. Our Scout Troop number 967G. So this is our all-girl troop that's chartered under Boy Scouts of America. There's an all-boy troop that's, gonna, that's chartering starting January 1. Uh, but this is our all-girl troop. They're offering a fundraiser and service project that's described in the bulletin. There are very brightly colored flyers available out in the Narthex Welcome Center with a QR code on it, which you can scan with your phone in, for the purpose of ordering breakfast sandwiches to pick up this coming Saturday in Aberdeen. Uh, and for every sandwich they make and sell, uh, another, a, another one will be donated to those in need. So it's a combination sort of project. Christmas angel tags are available on the glass door out here under the breezeway by the church office. Please feel free to take a tag, buy the item on the tag, and return it uh, according to the directions in the bulletin. Our Sunday school is sponsoring an Advent project, collecting items for the food pantry at the Havity Grace Middle School High School. Uh, check that out in the bulletin as well. And now I want to call on Ridge uh, for a mission moment about our Christmas missions. And as she's coming on up here to share the pulpit, just to let you know, this is in lieu of placing live poinsettias. We'll be using silk poinsettias. Instead, we can place mission gifts in memory or in honor of loved ones. Come on up, Ridge. Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to be at this service. I forgot people got here this late. <laughs> My cousin Jim gave us a wedding present many years ago that was completely unexpected and wonderful, a heifer for a family in Nigeria. When I read the accompanying card, I was so pleased that he thought of us as a couple that would understand this kind of gift. My dad lived on a farm that had been in his family for 11 generations, so I knew what a heifer is, and that calves and milk would be a part of the gift for many years. Last year at Christmas and Easter, we had opportunities to remember our friends and family who are no longer here, and our friends and family who are, with contributions to special missions. This year, we're doing the same. And I agree, the altar looks radiant with all the poinsettias during the Christmas season, echoing our gratitude and praise to God. But our chance of choir offers praise as well. And I'm sure God enjoys our gifts to the needy even more than God enjoys the flowers. Anna's House here in Harford County provides safety and a secure place to stay for women and their children escaping from abuse in a relationship. My friend Judy said her daughter went there 10 years ago and the quiet and safe environment gave her time to think and reclaim her life. This past year, they had a garden providing fresh vegetables for everyone to share. 
across the street, the Helping Up Mission provides a spiritual recovery program for up to 400 men a year. They have expanded their program to include women and children with housing and treatment. 200 women are enrolled, and last month, 50 children moved in as well. While the moms are in the recovery program, children will be in school or daycare, all of them safe and secure. This is a huge opportunity for women who could not enter the program without a safe place for their children. I will donate to the Helping Out Mission in memory of my husband, Jim, who volunteered there. Around the world is the children of Zion Village in Namibia. These 75 orphan children receive housing, schooling, and medical care through the donations of Christians. This will be a timely gift for my school teacher daughter, as I remember her. Stories about the children and their successes will go to her in my Christmas card. Think about giving these gifts that keep on giving as you remember loved ones who are no longer here and those who bring us happiness every day. The Habit of Grace United Methodist Church Mission Committee thanks you. Thank you, Ridge. And uh, there are forms available to do this out in the narthex, also tucked in your bulletins, I believe. And uh, you can choose any of the three or all three of the missions And uh, as we seek to reach out here across the street and around the world. We are in sacred space. We're invited into sacred time. And so let's all take a deep breath in and let it out slowly as we center ourselves in the presence of God's Holy Spirit and invite Lynn to call us to worship. Lynn? Good morning. Please stand in heart or body and join me in the call to worship, reading responsibly. They will not hurt or destroy on all my, mount, my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are the followers of that root of Jesse we find in Isaiah. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. Christ defends the poor, delivers the needy, and lives through all generations. In him, righteousness shall flourish and peace abound. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. His glory fills the earth. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace. They help remind us that we are a people rising toward God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement that there are some who hold on to hope and that there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel, God with us, is still our fervent prayer. Today we light the candle of peace. Now as a sign of the reconciliation Jesus Christ has made between us and God, and our desire to be reconciled with others, we pass God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. Peace of the Lord be 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 with you, Lynn. Peace of the Lord be with you, Taylor. Peace of the Lord be with you, Nancy. Peace of the Lord be with you.
Please pray together. Spirit of wisdom, come and rest. Give us a spirit of understanding and knowledge. Grant us to live in harmony, that your mercy may prevail. Gird our spirit with your steadfastness, that hope and peace may fill all hearts, and with one voice we may glorify your name. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Randy and Rama and Mark and Jennifer to join me up here in the front of the sanctuary for just a moment, please. In your bulletins and also up on the screen, there's a place, uh, some wording f for the congregation to respond at the appropriate time. <laughs> Rama's going to get me back later, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I did. That's it. Very good. So, right page. We don't want to push people out of here. Let's, let me say that. But we also don't want to let them slip away unnoticed, right? So that's why we're doing this today. And... Um, Randy has sung in our cantata choirs over the years. Rayma has served on trustees, staff parish relations committee, and they've, uh, both of them hosted a youth Bible study that we had for a period of time in their home with their dog. Um, that was a good experience. Yep, okay. And served the community in many other ways. And we'll soon be moving to, I think, South Carolina? South Carolina. Now, Jennifer and Mark have worshipped with us for a while, made this their, their faith home, all the while letting me know that we're moving to Tennessee. So anyway, temporarily with us, we're just so glad to have you with us. So, the church is a family, united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're all brothers and sisters, and for a time, Havity Grace United Methodist Church is our home. Like every human family, however, our church home is formed and reformed over time as members are born, as they die, as they are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home in a different place. And for a time, Rama and Randy and Jennifer and Mark have lived here with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's heavy loads. Together we have laughed and cried. We have worshipped and praised God. Together we have lived. Now please respond from the screen or your bulletin. We feel sorrow in your leaving, and yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support, yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be your new church family as you have added much to ours. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Rama and Randy and Mark and Jennifer, members of this congregation, participants in this congregation who are about to leave us, keep and preserve them, O Lord, in all health and safety, both of body and soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace, and our prayers go with you. And any time that you are anywhere near Havity Grace, we expect you to be back here if it's a weekend. Thank you very much. As a caring congregation and a praying people, I'm going to share with you some concerns and joys of which I'm aware and invite you, if you recognize some of these folk, to reach out to them with a call or a card to let them know that we have them or their loved ones in our prayers or that we are sharing their joy. I bid your prayers this week for the family and friends of Lauren, uh, Mary Jane's brother, who died yesterday after uh, being on hospice care and battling cancer uh, for a time. And uh, I know that uh, not only is our prayer love with you, Mary Jane, but you will take our prayer love uh, to Lauren and his family, and all your extended family. I bid your prayers for the family and friends of Edwina, the mother of Gina. Gina's the daughter of Dick and Janice. 
Edwina died Thursday morning after a long illness, and especially I bid your prayers for Gina, who has been her mother's constant companion and caregiver as she navigates her own grief. Would somebody be willing to reach out to Dick and Janice? Thank you. I bid your prayers for Walter, known in the community as Pee Wee, a member of Susquehanna Hose Company. He's in citizen's care for rehab following a stroke. Would somebody be willing to reach out to Walter and Kay? Thank you. I bid your prayers for Ned, Linda's husband. He's at Perry Point VA Hospital for rehab, slowly improving. And he was able today to get a pass to go out uh, for his great-granddaughter Quinn's baptism. Praise God for that. And it is hoped that he'll be home this week. So he is, he's doing well. Would somebody be willing to reach out to, to Linda? Thank you. I bid your prayers for um, Janet, uh, Becky's son's mother-in-law, a resident of Bully Rock and a neighbor of Connie and Harry. Janet is in Lorraine Bully Rock for rehab following a, a surgical repair of a spinal fracture. And I know, Becky, you'll take our prayer love on to Janet. I bid your prayers for Gary, who's a friend of Connie and a retired United Methodist pastor in northern Ohio. He is home from the hospital, praise God for that, but still dealing with continuing health issues and undergoing medical testing. And I bid your prayers for Paula, again, a friend of Connie's, who is also the wife of Joe, who has sung in our cantatas before. Paula is recovering from knee surgery this past week, but she is home from the hospital. And I know, Connie, you will take our prayer love, love on to both Gary and Paula. I bid your prayers for Charlotte, who's a friend of uh, Nancy, who worships at 815. Uh, this would be Lisa's mom. Uh, Charlotte is in citizen care for rehab for at least another week. It's sort of week by week, so we want to keep Charlotte in our prayers. I bid your prayers for Becky, who is Pastor Ron's aunt and a resident of St. John's Tower. She's in rehab after brain surgery. She's doing very well, but she's still in rehab, hasn't come home just yet. I bid your prayers for Howard, who is the father of a neighbor of Nancy. Again, Nancy is the mother of Lisa. And uh, her neighbors just ask that we pray for, for her father, Howard, just to keep him in our prayers. God knows whatever the situation is. I bid your prayers for healing for Paul and Ruth. How many of you would be willing to send a card to Paul and Ruth? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I bid your prayers for all those battling covid or flu, or RSV. We seem to be dealing with a lot of viruses these days. And I bid your prayers for peace between the people of Ukraine and Russia. We have a number of joys today. It is a joy to let you know that Dolores, Kevin's older sister, who was in Mercy Hospital battling COVID and age 80, had other health issues, she's home. So praise God for that. And and Kevin, just know we share your joy in that. It's a joy to note that some folk have received good news after medical testing. You know, medical testing, they say, negative results. That's a good thing in medical testing, right? It's a joy to share with you that Quinn, Ned, and Linda's great-granddaughter is being baptized today. That's a big step. We praise God for that. And we want to thank God for all those who have recovered from COVID, from the flu, or RSV. Our sister Sue... Uh, got her stitches out, and her son Aaron is also healing well after a close encounter with a neighbor's dog, uh, and Sue fell. So the two of them have been dealing with bodily injury. They're all healing, so praise God for that. It's a joy to let you know that Kathy, Cecil's wife, had an 85th birthday yesterday. Would somebody be willing to reach out? Thank you very much. It's a joy to let you know that Steve, the husband of Elaine, has recovered well from a recent heart procedure. We praise God for that. I had a mom tell me this morning that she is thanking God for teachers after spending five days getting her kindergartner to do his homework because he had COVID. So thank God for teachers and what they do. (laughs) Okay? And it's a joy to share with you that yesterday at the craft and cookie sale... Our our United Women in Faith, formerly United Methodist Women, United Women in Faith cleared $532. Praise God for that. And uh, thanks to all of you who baked things, made things, worked the sale, or bought things. Now, with our hearts and minds filled with all these joys and concerns, let us go to God in silent prayer as we share with God those things of not named aloud.
Righteous God, righteous God, we humbly acknowledge that there are those cut off from home and heritage to build someone else's prosperity. There are those cut off from songs and customs and culture by a world that expects more misery and more money. There are women living in fear. There are children hiding. Heal, O Lord, this abused and broken world and bring your peace to bear. There are those, Lord, grieving. There are those, Lord, who are sick or in recovery from surgery. There are those caught up in the violence of war. Bring, O Lord, your peace. Grant us to live in harmony and let your mercy prevail. Like a shoot from a dead stump, Make us grow into new life and new hope. Thanks and praise be to you, Lord, for healing and for health maintained, for the newness of life and the inspiration of flagging spirits. Thank you for renewed energy and inspiration in our lives. Thank you for those times and places when courageous souls work for peace in the midst of conflict. Thank you. For the joy of a hope undimmed by the passing of the years. Through Christ our living Savior. Amen. Our psalter this morning is Psalm 72, verses 1 through 8. The psalmist prays for the king to care about the poor and to do justice so the nation can prosper in peace. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> Our scripture lesson is Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. Assyria threatens Judah, but the prophet sees beyond the present to a paradise restored. He uses words about an earthly king to, to describe the Messiah and the messianic age to come. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eye see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. So 
Taylor, I invite you to come over, and as you're coming over, and you can pick up the microphone, I just want to say hello to those who are out there. And we want to greet Emmy and Ashlyn today, and Adeline, Molly, and Lola, and Emmett, Addie, Autumn, and Amira, and Rory, Jill, and James, and Zoe, and Max, and Scout, and Wyatt, and Will, and Amelia, Breezy, and Ileana, and Maddie, and Jasper, and Charlotte, and Henry, and Bodie, and Ian, and Jesse, and Charlie, and Ben, and Eleanor, Rain, and Lorelai, and Elena, and Eli, and Michael, and Lillian, and Hazel, and Iris, and Emmy, and Andrew. And if I miss saying your name, I welcome you too, and we're glad that you're with us. So I'm going to ask you to hold that right up to your mouth and say hello. Hi. Okay, it's working. All right. So last week, I was saying that I'm doing a series of messages, and it goes through Christmas. It keeps going. It's about traveling. It's about traveling. And last week, we talked about how the innkeeper probably had to bring things like food and stuff to the, to the inn. We also talked about how Jesus was born in a stable, okay? So, because Jesus was born in a stable, our manger scenes usually involve animals. Animals, okay? So, and we sort of have traditional ideas about what animals that involved. One of the animals we tend to think of is sheep. So what's, what sound do sheep make? What's the, that's right. That's our traditional idea of what sheep... Dude, and that's a, that's a cultural thing. Other cultures use other, na- other sounds. Like, you know, we say a, a dog goes woof, woof. And other cultures, they say wah, wah. So it varies by culture. Okay. So, and just because of our own culture, we think there were cows there. We don't know if there were cows there, but we think. What sound do cows make? New. New, right? And... Uh, there's another sheep. That sheep was grazing and eating this sheep. This sheep is just standing there looking up. Okay. And then we have another kind of sheep. What's going on here? Being held. Yeah, it's a sheep being held by a shepherd boys. A lamb, I guess, on the shoulders. Right? So that's another sheep. And then we think maybe a donkey was there. What kind of sound do donkeys make? Nay. Yeah, they, they neigh, like horses. He all, we say they bray. He all, right? And then I have another donkey from a different set. And what do you see is going on with this donkey? This donkey has some interesting things going on there. Traveling. Traveling, and what is on the donkey, or what, what's the donkey doing? Lying down. It's lying down, but it's got a bunch of things it's been carrying, right? Yes, a bunch of things that... Donkey's resting right now, but it's been carrying a bunch of stuff, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Now, what animal do you think this is? A goat. Yeah, I don't know if that's a goat or some kind of weird sheep, but um, (laughs) I I think it's a goat. Do you know what kind of sound a goat makes? I don't either. Okay. It rams into people. What's that? It rams into people. It rams into people and eats all kind of things it shouldn't, and yeah, I don't know what the story is with the goat, but anyway... We have a goat. And at home, we have another set that's got, you know, seals and all kinds of things for for some reason. I don't know why. (laughs) Octopus and a bunch of other things. Someone in our household who loves animals went a little bonkers. But anyway, I want to think about this. We would like to think that Mary, who was about to have a baby, rode on a donkey to get to Bethlehem because it's a long way to walk. But the truth is we don't know that. And women, through the ages, have walked long distances even when they were about to have a baby. But we would like to think Mary was on a donkey. And this donkey is carrying things, so maybe a donkey carried Mary. We sometimes say that when someone cares about another person, they have a burden for them. A burden, that's an expression. They care about them. They worry about them. They pray for them. Can you think of anybody who cares about you and prays for you? Family. Family. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Parents. Parents. Siblings. Siblings. Um, Animals. Animals. And God. And God. All right. Very good. I also want you to look around this room. Look at all these people. Yeah. Our church friends. I hope you always know that somebody loves you, cares for you, worries over you, praise for you, okay? Um, That's real important. And here's what I want you to remember this week. When you see an animal, and I know you're going to see animals, 
When you see an animal, I want you to say, first of all, two things. Thank you, God, for animals, because they add a lot to life, love, and other things. So thank you, God, for animals. But also, let's thank God for all those people who care about us and pray for us. So thank you, God, for the people who love me. Can you do that? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for animals in our lives who show us love and do so many wonderful things for us. And thank you, God, for those who love us and worry over us, and care for us, and pray for us. Help us to remember to pray for others, too. In Jesus' name, amen. So what's going to remind us of God this week? When we see an animal. When we see an animal, yes, and we're going to remember two things. What's one of them? Thank you, God, for animals. Thank you, God, for animals. And what's the other? Thank you, God, for people that love us. Thank you, God, for people who love us, who carry a burden for us, who pray for us. Yes, thank you for helping me with this message. Thank you very much. Pretty bouncy for a lullaby, but I got to say what a joy it is to hear traditional words to a different tune. Yeah, so sometimes we get the message differently when the tune is different, so thank you for that. 
Each Sunday, I've promised to bring you a God moment, and this is a God moment I got uh, in an email from one of our fellowship. She writes, I was watching Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue on YouTube last night. Didn't pay attention to the name of the orchestra or the pianist. The music was joy-filled, and the pianist smiled, and the, the conductor and all the members seemed to be enjoying the experience. At the end, the audience erupted in applause, and the conductor bowed and then motioned for the pianist to accept the accolades of the audience. Instead, he turned to the conductor and hugged him, and they just stood there hugging and smiling, and I imagined God hugging them both for the lovely music. Music is a gift of God, a God moment. During Advent, we're engaging in a short series of sermons entitled Rising Up to Christmas. So Advent is really more than just preparation for Christmas, more than just a lead up to Christmas, although that's the way our culture frames it. Advent also does help us prepare because we're not only looking for the coming of Christ in the future and remembering the coming of Christ in the past, we're also seeking to welcome welcome Christ into our hearts in the present. And our readings from the prophet Isaiah and the Psalms are guiding us this season in this sermon series. That's what we're focusing on, the lessons from Isaiah and the Psalms. And they are calling us upward to a higher worship of God in Christ Jesus. Today, on the second Sunday of Advent, those Bible lessons, the one from Isaiah and the Psalms, they challenge us to be signals of peace, signals of peace. Of peace. In the afternoon of Sunday, December 7th, 1941, 81 years ago this Wednesday, there was a National Football League game being played in Griffith Stadium between the Philadelphia Eagles and the local NFL team in Washington, D.C. That stadium is where the Howard University Hospital is now located. Strangely, it was noted during this game that various news media personnel and high-ranking military officers and civil servants in attendance were being paged over the public address system to report to their offices. That same day, probably in the evening, my mother and some friends were gathered in one of the practice rooms in the basement of Margaret Brent Hall, affectionately called the Maggie B, which was the women's dormitory at the University of Maryland College Park. It is now known as Dorchester Hall and stands next to the infirmary. By the way, Margaret Brent was a famous leader who saved the Maryland colony in its early years. You can look that up. These practice rooms in the basement were provided for music majors Each of them contained a piano, and in theory, they were sort of soundproof so that you weren't disturbing the whole rest of the dormitory with your piano playing and singing or whatever you were doing in the practice room. They had gathered there to sing Christmas carols when someone ran in who had been listening to a radio and shouted, they've bombed Pearl Harbor. They've bombed Pearl Harbor. The story about the football game I heard 35, 40 years ago when I was serving a church in Northern Virginia where many of the members worked at the Pentagon. That story was still being told. The other story, of course, came from my mother. And in her telling of that story, she would sometimes add that when she returned for the spring semester, all the men had disappeared from campus. And then she said, here they came marching from class to class in uniform, and because they could not break formation, they would mow you down if you were in the way on the sidewalk. I think she felt they were a little ungentlemanly in that regard. One of those GIs became my father. (laughs) Just saying. (laughs) That's a story for another time. Many of us are familiar with the the iconic black and white footage of President Franklin D. Roosevelt asking Congress to declare that a state of war existed between the United States and the Empire of Japan dating from December 7, 1941, a date, he said, which will live in infamy. 
Asking Congress for a declaration of war following such an unprovoked invasion seems a bit quaint today. Since that time, we have experienced undeclared wars, conflicts, we use different terms, police actions, and now in the global community, we have a special operation. President, Russian President Vladimir Putin's euphemism for his war against Ukraine. A war is a war by any name. Friends, we are called, we are called as disciples of Christ to make not a declaration of war, not a declaration of independence, but a declaration of peace. That's what Isaiah is telling us. That's what Psalm 72 is telling us today. Today. Both of these passages, by the way, describe the perfect king, the perfect ruler. The perfect ruler is one who brings prosperity to the people. And it's understood in these two passages that justice and peace are necessary preconditions for prosperity. I think that's an interesting point to make. We are better off when we're not at war. We're better off not when we're conquering other peoples, but when we're trading with them. The biblical sort of idea. Now, the early church looked to these passages to understand who Jesus is, who Messiah is. The early church, having experienced the presence of God in Jesus of Nazareth, reflects on that and goes, huh, he rose from the dead. What, what, how do we frame this? And they looked at the Hebrew Scriptures, their Scriptures, to figure out how to do that. And they looked to these passages and understood that Jesus, the Messiah, is the perfect ruler. But the follow-on to that, the follow-on to that is the challenge to be who we are supposed to be. We know who Jesus is. Who are we supposed to be as Jesus' disciples? Isaiah ends with the call for us to be a signal to the peoples. A signal to the peoples. Now, the older translations used to say, an ensign to the nations. An ensign to the nations. But English as a living language continues to evolve, so most of us, when we hear the word ensign, we think of a low-ranking officer in the Navy, below the rank of lieutenant, a recent graduate of the Naval Academy in Annapolis. I believe when they graduate, they're all commissioned as ensigns. Some translations use the word sign. Ours says signal, signal to the peoples. The words nations and peoples, that's code language in the Bible, usually for Gentiles. So the idea is here, the idea here is that not just God's chosen people, but everybody to be a signal to everybody, because everybody gets included in the love of God eventually. A sign. You know, signs are mute. They don't speak. Well, maybe they do if they've got some kind of audio feature, but anyway. Signs don't usually speak, but they sure can say a lot. Road signs tell us a great deal about what's ahead and, and how we should behave as drivers. Sometimes we pay attention to those signs. Sometimes we don't. As disciples, we're called to proclaim peace. But friends, let's be honest. We live in such a divided society. Democrats and, and Republicans and Green Partiers and Libertarians and Freedom Partiers and gun control advocates and social conservatives and progressives. Now, we can all get together and join hands and sing Kumbaya, right? Probably not. Pretty much impossible to get in the same room and not just be shouting at each other. Our divides are too deep. In the early 19th century, a Quaker preacher named Edward Hicks painted a series of paintings called The Peaceable Kingdom based on our reading from Isaiah. And that's what you see up on the screen. That's one of his versions of The Peaceable Kingdom. It pictures animals clustered around a small child. The animals depicted in a sort of folk art style, are smiling. And 
He painted, we think, over a hundred of these. It's just the same thing, but slightly different in different cases. Usually, there's a European man in the background meeting with a group of Native Americans to make a treaty. That's William Penn, the famous Quaker founder of Pennsylvania. There are known to be around 62 examples of this painting, this series, still in existence. This is a painting about overcoming barriers, overcoming differences, living in peace and harmony together. But historians have noted the image changes over time. In the earlier paintings, the animals are kind and even playful in their depiction. But as time went on, the teeth got sharper and the snarls more obvious. Hicks is said to have begun to lose hope in humanity as he got older and as he saw the barriers grow higher and stronger and the animosities around him get deeper and more violent. First of all, the Quakers disapproved of Hicks painting as being too fancy, too decorative, not plain enough. You see, in the Quaker tradition, you're to be plain, not supposed to be showy. And, and that's understandable, although my mother, who was a birthright Quaker herself, once remarked in somewhat acid tones that all her Quaker relatives had the very best of plain. So the cars might have been black, but they were Packards, if you know what I mean. Yeah, the Rolls Royce of the automakers of that day. So what happened was that Hicks had to give up preaching in order to paint. They weren't going to have it. He couldn't be a preacher and paint. And then William Penn's treaty was destroyed by the massacre of the misnamed Conestoga Band, really they were Susquehannocks, in Lancaster, the day after Christmas. They were there under protective custody because of a previous massacre. They broke in and killed all of the men, women, and children. A massacre which caused the last band of that nation in Harford County to flee the state. They were over in what we call Rock State Park, they fled the state to go to locations northwest of Maryland. And then, third, Hicks saw the Quaker faith he loved so much, riven with conflict and torn asunder into smaller and smaller groups because of theological differences. Friends, that sounds familiar, doesn't it, in the United Methodist Church of this day? And this, all of this greatly discouraged him. And so in his later paintings, as the animals look fiercer, the Christ child, because that's who the child is, the Christ child tightens his grip on the lion's mane and the bear's neck, holding them in place with sheer strength when their will is not his. You see, as Hicks began losing his faith in the human community, he began to cling even more tightly to Christ. In Christ, Hicks could put his hope, his real hope. And so it is for us. Our divides are too deep until somehow we see a higher truth, a deeper reality, until we point the way to Jesus, who we're called not only to declare peace, but to be peace. to lean into Jesus' way, to be peacemakers. Now, Isaiah, Isaiah begins this passage by speaking of death, a stump. The stump of a nation, a dream cut off and destroyed and ended. But out of that death comes a shoot, a sprig of life, a bit of green. Out of that nightmare comes a new dream, a new hope. And that's what Advent says to us. That hope out of despair is possible, that life out of death is real, that a dream of a way of living that honors both God and our neighbor is not only possible but within reach 
if we but set aside what keeps us apart, the differences that make us suspicious of each other and hold on to our common humanity. That's why Jesus calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Because they are ourselves. They're just like us. So when we love, when we welcome, when we share Emmanuel, we stand as a signal to the nations, a signal that there is a God among us and there is a way to know peace and there is hope and despair and there is joy even in our brokenness. We are called, my friends, to stand as a signal, a signal of peace. Advent is a reminder of that call and that hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now please stand in heart or body as we sing together, Come, come, thou long-expected Jesus. Please be seated. As the ushers wait, a, wait on us for, our, for God's tithes and our offerings, thank you for your continued support, support of Christ's ministry here. Just know that there are two offerings today. The, the first is the usual. The second one is for the sacramental fund to meet local needs. Please give as God leads. And please mark your gifts if they're for the sacramental fund with an SF so it's clear that that's what it's for. And however it is we're able to support Christ's ministry, whether it's time, talent, or treasure, know that we are called to recommit ourselves to Jesus Christ. Uh, and there's a, screen, there's a question on the screen to ponder as we think about that.
Please remain standing in heart or body as we pray responsively the prayer of great thanksgiving in preparation for celebrating Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, for you formed us in your image and gave us life, and when our love failed, yours did not. Instead, you freed us from captivity and made covenant to be our God and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall we learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to all the nations. Born as a baby in a stable, yet he grew up to offer his life for ours, his body for our nurture. Suffering death on a cross, yet he arose to new life, so that this holy meal is not the remembrance of a death, but a joyful acceptance of the gift of life offered and shared. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you created your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And by the openness of this, his table, he is a signal to your gracious hospitality in the whole fellowship of faith of which we are a part. So on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. And returning thanks to you, he broke that bread and gave it to his friends and followers, saying to them, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, he took the cup. And again, returning thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so remembering these your mighty saving works in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice together with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these the gifts of field and vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now let us join our hearts and voices as we pray together That's that prayer which Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The loaf which we share. Is it not a sharing in the body of Christ, our crucified and risen Lord? The cup over which we give thanks. Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ, our crucified and risen Redeemer? Here are the gifts of God for the people of God. We are all invited to commune. Please be seated. We are invited now to take uh, our communion kit and access either the wafer or the bread, depending on which type of kit you have. And just hold that for a moment so that we can receive together in token of our unity in the Holy Spirit. The body of Christ, broken for each of us and for all of us, thanks be to God. And then we're invited to access the juice in our communion kits. And again, just hold that for a moment so that we can receive together, again, in token of our unity in the Holy Spirit. The blood of Christ poured out for each of us and for all of us. Thanks be to God. And now, having communed with Christ our Lord, but also with one another in the, in the fellowship of faith, let's join our hearts and voices as we pray together. Great architect of this world, your vision for creation was for all to dwell together in peace. By calling us to your sacred table, you have gathered us together. By feeding us, you have filled our hunger by your presence, fill all our hungers that we may not be tempted to devour each other. Through Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Following the closing blessing, we're always welcome to stay and meditate as we hear the postlude. Please remember as we leave, we're to take with us our used communion materials and place those in the trash. Friends, as prophets of old, put forth bold, broad dreams of the coming of God. So may we today envision unlikely, precious life, possible once more as the divine draws near. Go forth to be faithful and courageous in your commitment to that incarnation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.